Hi, today we're going to be talking about uh, module 1.6, which is cell division. And some of the things that you need to know are that mitosis is the division of the nucleus into two genetically identical daughter nuclei. The chromosomes condense by supercoiling during the process of mitosis. Cytokinesis occurs after mitosis and is different in plant and animal cells. Interphase is a very active phase of the cell cycle. It is not a part of mitosis. Many processes are occurring in this phase and uh, uh, you get a lot of changes in the nucleus and, uh, and the cytoplasm. Things are going on there. Um, you have cyclins. These are involved in controlling the cell cycle along with some kinase molecules. And you have mutagens, oncogenes, and metastasis all being found, uh, uh, involved in the formation of a tumor, which is runaway cell growth or when cell division kind of goes awry. Um, some of the things that you need to know how to do is uh, identify the different phases of mitosis in cells that are viewed uh, either with a microscope or from a micrograph, something that you would look at, and you want to determine the mitotic index from that micrograph. So let's start by looking at interphase. An interphase is a very active portion of the cell cycle, and there's a lot of processes that are occurring here. The cell is doing its job, and you have the organelles that might be uh, replicated or being replaced, things like that. The cell's growing, and protein synthesis is also occurring. And if you look at this right here, you can see G1S and G2 are all comprising interphase, and they're completely different from the M phase, which is mitosis, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And uh, G1 is the first growth phase and cells, um, once they reach G1, if they're not dividing like muscle and nerve cells don't divide, they might enter into a phase of what's known as G0. Um, but if they receive the appropriate signals, then they enter the S phase, which is where they synthesize their DNA. And then after that, they uh, prepare for division. It's a second gap phase or second growth phase where um, some organelles might be replicated in preparation for mitosis. So what mitosis is now, the M phase, this is the uh, division of the cell's nucleus. So this is where the actual cell is dividing. And the most important thing for a cell undergoing mitosis is to produce two genetically identical um, uh, nuclei when the cell is done. Um, otherwise, you'd have a mutation and that could lead to all sorts of problems. But you want two genetically identical cells when all is said and done. And mitosis, we said, is the division of the cell's nucleus. And you should be able to recognize some of the important um, features of these cells uh, when you look at a micrograph. And you can see here's kind of the, the animated version, the, 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 the pictures, uh, if you will. And then you've got some micrographs down here. And then over here, you've got an actual micrograph of a slide, um, which looks like maybe some onion cells that were... Um, uh, undergoing mitosis. And you can see here in interphase, this is where the cell, you can just, you know, if it's stained properly, you can see the nucleus, uh, but there's not much going on there. It's pretty nondescript. But once you get into prophase, you can see that the chromosomes here are starting to condense. And then when you get into prometaphase, now the nuclear envelope is starting to break down and um, the, uh, you're getting further condensation of the chromosomes. And then once you get to metaphase, you've got this kind of uh, imaginary um, uh, metaphase plate along the equator where these uh, microtubules are grabbing a hold of the uh, um, sister chromatids and they're getting kind of in a tug of war and they're starting to line up here. And then uh, once they, uh, the proteins start to break down and the uh, sister chromatids start to separate, you, you enter into anaphase and now the genetic material is being hauled off to the opposite ends of the cell where the new nucleus will form inside of the new cells once cytokinesis uh, um, completes the process. And then with cytokinesis in, in telophase here, um, you've got the new nuclei reforming and then the actual division of the, the cytoplasm. So if we go over here and look, you can see a lot of these darker stained uh, cells. These are um, uh, the, the interphase cells. Um, if you can't see the nuclei, then you don't really know what phase they're in. Here's a metaphase cell. These are some anaphase cells here, um, you know, some various ones perhaps in prophase where the prophase or prometaphase where the uh, nuclear envelope is breaking down again, the, the chromosomes are condensing further. Um, here's a telophase and cytokinesis one. This is probably actually be cytokinesis because you can see the uh, cell walls forming between these two and, and uh, the nucleus is starting to um, kind of re relax the DNA in there and it's going to be uh, preparing for doing its job. So. Um, you should be able to identify the cells in the varying stages of, of mitosis um, just by looking at pictures or uh, micrographs. Um, and then one of the useful things that we want to do is calculate the mitotic index. And what the mitotic index basically is, is, is it's just a simple ratio between dividing cells and non-dividing cells. So if we want to know the formula, 
the mitotic index is the ratio between the number of cells in mitosis divided by the total number of cells. So if we go through here and we look and we, we count the um, cells, I did this ahead of time, um, we find out that there are 14 cells undergoing mitosis. You can see here like we would count these. There's one in metaphase. Here's you know metaphase. This is uh, telophase and so forth. And um, the total number of cells that we had here was 52. Okay. And so if we are interested in the mitotic index, we divide that out and we find the mitotic index is 0.269. So then we could take this number and we could compare it to the mitotic index of say some normal tissue. And that might lead us to um, determine whether the cell is undergoing a formation of a tumor, whether it is a tumor, you know, whether the, the organism is growing, whatever you, you uh, may be after. But the mitotic index is simply that ratio and then the numbers will tell you um, information that you can then draw further conclusions from. So during mitosis, um, the chromosomes undergo a lot of different types of things. And uh, the DNA uh, needs to be managed properly. What I tell my cell, uh, students all the time is that it's like a bowl of spaghetti. The, the DNA is relaxed. There's a lot of it in the cells. And um, especially in eukaryotic cells, there's a lot of it that needs to be managed. And it, with eukaryotic cells, if you recall from an earlier lesson, it's associated with protein, whereas the prokaryotic DNA is not. And in the process of readying itself for mitosis, so as the DNA is being synthesized, you can see that it starts to link up with these histone proteins. It starts to get coiled around them and then super coiled. And then you get this characteristic structure of the chromosome that we're, we're used to. And so in interphase, again, the, the DNA is relaxed because the cell is doing its job expressing the genes, whereas in mitosis, the cell is uh, um, preparing for division, so the DNA has to be managed because we want the two cells that we're um, ultimately going to form to have the exact same uh, copies of the DNA. So we talked about these chromosomes getting condensed, and, and uh, one of the things that I mentioned to you is in the metaphase now, the, this is where a tug of war is taking place between the microtubules on either side of this metaphase plate, and uh, the pinched together region is the centromere of the uh, replicated chromosomes, and the kinetochore is the site where the microtubules attach. And then uh, once the proteins that kind of join these sister chromatids together start to break down, the um, uh, microtubules are going to pull in, this is when we would enter into anaphase here, it's going to pull these uh, um, chromosomes to opposite ends of the cell. So I tell my students that it's kind of like your, your fingers are joined together in metaphase and as soon as you see them pulling apart, that's when if you're looking at a micrograph, you would know that it's entered into antiphase here. And uh, in, in anaphase, you can see all of these uh, proteins have broken down that were formerly holding these uh, sister chromatids together. So. Um, during the process now of cytokinesis, once the genetic material gets moved to the opposite ends of the cell, this is the, the process of pinching this cell in two. And it's uh, important to note that it's different in plant and animal cells. In the plant cells, the cell wall is pretty rigid and it poses some problems. So as this cell gets larger and uh, is in need of division, it's going to undergo... Um, the, the process of mitosis where it's going to copy the DNA and move it to the opposite ends of the cell. And then if you recall from an earlier lesson, the, uh, the cell is going to be transcribing, translating some um, of the uh, RNA into proteins in the rough ER that's going to go to the Golgi apparatus. And you have a bunch of these Golgi-derived vesicles that are going to form this cell plate uh, across the um, elongated cell here that has two new nuclei, um, which you can't really see. There would be a, a nucleus here and a nucleus here, perhaps. And then as this cell plate gets laid down, eventually it's going to form a cell wall, and then it's going to split into um, two new cells that are each going to end up with a nucleus with the genetic material in them uh, when all is said and done. And um, the cell would be divided in two, and that would be in a plant cell. In an animal cell now, 
it's slightly different. Um, what we have in an animal cell is we get a contractile ring of actin that starts to form and it starts to uh, interact with the myosin molecules that are on the inside of this plasma membrane and when the actin and myosin interact with one another they contract and that's going to act to ultimately kind of pinch this cell in two and then you're going to end up with two genetically identical daughter cells when this process is all done. So that's how it's different in plant and animal cells. Now the cell cycle itself is controlled by a bunch of regulatory proteins and it's, uh, there's two main types that we need to be concerned with, both, uh, both cyclins and kinases. And the cyclin levels, as you can see here, they rise and fall during the cell cycle. And um, at varying times, some of the concentrations might be high, whereas in other times the, the concentration might be low. But the important thing to know is that for the most part, the kinase concentration is the same throughout the entire cell cycle. And the kinases are going to work, their enzymes are going to work by phosphorylating other proteins, either activating or inactivating them, and leading to changes uh, within the cell. So if you look here, um, these kinase molecules are called cyclin-dependent kinases because they're going to interact with the cyclins. These are always present in the cell for the most part. And at different times in the cell, we said that the cyclins and kinase levels are going to rise and fall. And you can see when they do rise, they're going to interact with the appropriate cyclin and initiate a lot of these changes that are associated with the cell cycle in general. Whether it's mitosis or whether it's interphase, you can see that there's a variety of different checkpoints that need to occur where the cell is going to check to make sure that the DNA was copied correctly. Or it's going to receive the signal to go from G1 into the S phase, which is going to be the ultimate signal that's going to lead to whether or not the cell is going to go through mitosis and actually divide. And there's a lot of uh, um, cyclin kinase interaction that leads to a lot of different changes in the cell. Some of the examples would be to um, uh, give the information that the condensation of the chromosomes need to occur so that the replication uh, you know, has taken place and now we're going to start to condense them down so that we can divide them. Um, the nuclear envelope is going to break down. We're going to put the microtubule spindle assembly together to get these uh, sister chromatids separated, etc. So there's a lot of different things that these things are going to do. And if the cell cycle goes awry, this is when we get something like along the lines of tumor development. And some basic vocabulary that we need to know just regarding the um, formations of the tumors is uh, what a mutagen is. And a mutagen is, is anything that can cause a change in the DNA and ultimately lead to cancer. Um, radiation, UV rays, X-rays, gamma rays, things like that will uh, damage the DNA. Um, there are certain chemicals that are present in, you know, tobacco, for instance, in foods that we eat, um, you know, just uh, certain chemicals that we may put on our skin or we might be exposed to. Um, certain infectious agents can definitely damage the DNA, and, and if they get into the right spot or they cause damage in the right spot, um, they can affect genes that are involved in the normal growth and development. So we have proto-oncogenes here, and what these do um, are regulating normal cell growth. And if they mutate, they become uh, known as an oncogene, and the oncogenes can cause cancer. So you can see over here, if we get some sort of a mutation in this proto-oncogene here, now we can have you know, like uh, uncontrolled cell growth. If this is if it occurs in a promoter region, you get some sort of a, a control element that gets mutated that's responsible for turning on and off the uh, cell growth and, and cell division and things like that, and now it's always on, that's what could lead to the formation of a tumor. Um, so we don't want these, these uh, proto-oncogenes to get mutated. We don't want anything to get mutated. And if we do get a mutation occurring and we get uh, a tumor formed, the original site of the tumor is what we call the primary tumor. And the primary tumor can spread to other portions of the body, which is what's called metastasis. That's when these cells spread. And they can spread anywhere and everywhere. And when they do so, if they set up shop and form a tumor in that portion of the body, then we refer to those uh, other tumors that formed from that primary cancer as a secondary tumor. So when a primary tumor metastasizes, it gives rise to new tumors, and those are referred to as secondary tumors. So I hope you remember learning about all of this in your class, and I hope this helped.